And this afternoon, the controversy unfolds. Minister for Justice and Attorney General Godfrey Yabodami is asking Finance Minister Kenneth Foriata not to impose any form of limitation on pre-existing bond or domestic bondholders that will adversely affect the personal rights and liberties of any of the parties to the bond agreement beyond their will. Now, government recently announced a debt exchange program that seeks to defer payments on interest on investments up until 2027. Uh, initial uh, impression that was created, uh, of course, by the finance minister together with government communicators was that the latest debt exchange program will be voluntary. However, Deputy Finance Minister John Kumar revealed on PM Express last night that domestic bondholders may be on their own if they do not sign up to the debt exchange program. This is a voluntary debt exchange. What does that mean? Okay, so let's take two countries like Jamaica and Greece. Jamaica did voluntary debt exchange like what we are doing in Ghana. It means that it's not compulsory. You choose to take the alternative of the exchange or you remain with what you want, uh, with what you have, and then maybe you go along with the consequences that come along with it. And Jamaica achieved about 99% participation. Okay. Greece went with uh, the legal or legislative, which is the coercive approach. And, uh, you know, it also had impact, not as positive as. Uh, but in the end, they both achieved debt sustainability. What the voluntary allows is more engagement and collaboration, amicable and a more orderly way of uh, executing this uh, debt uh, uh, structural operation, debt operations that we want to do. So government has chosen to go by the voluntary approach so that we, we strongly believe that these are partners who have benefited from the Ghana bond market. Yes, we are in difficult times and we either swim together or we sink together. And government is saying, let us find a way at the moment to reduce some of the benefits that goes to our partners, so that over a period we can redeem and begin to see the same profitability that we have enjoyed all this. So it's voluntary. When you met the institutional investors, did they indicate to you that they will sign on? Oh, yes. We are very confident about it. No, because you, that's confidence different, but did they actually they did. indicate to you that they will sign on? Yes, they will sign on. All of them? You, you, didn't, you well, didn't have I, some institutions well, fighting this? You know, initially some will express uh, reservations but when you explain to them and the enormity of the problem and where we are and how we can all get out better most of them agree and I believe that uh, we're gonna have so what happens because it's voluntary right yeah. what happens to those institutions who refuse to sign on okay so then you don't get the the carrots the benefits the buffers that has provided and then you're on your own uh, it means that you are open to default in terms of if the market is unable to redeem, you know, fine. Like you said, you may even go to court because of the default. Yeah, they can sue you. Yeah, you can sue you. But uh, in the end, if you sue a man of straw in a broken system, what benefits are you hoping to gain? So it is better we work together and then we support each other to get out of the difficulty. And I believe many of them will be understanding uh, uh, these arrangements. And we'll continue to engage them let them be rest assured that uh, we, we stand to gain better together than to fight over these matters. So, but there, there's also an, an alternative, yes. and you just mentioned, where you are allowed as a state to use a parliamentary process or through legislation. Yeah, the coercive approach. Yes. Yeah, we, we know. Have, but, you, have you considered that? Yes, but we don't want to use that approach because, like you said, these bondholders are known. and These are players in our economy over a long time. And they will continue to play in the Ghanaian economy, whether you are a pension fund or whatever bank or whatever. You still need a strong Ghanaian economy for your future profitability. Mm. So these are difficult times and we all need to come to an agreement that let's give up something and save the system for ourselves. I believe a better engagement, an orderly, amicable engagement will yield us better than the coercive approach. For now, that is how government thinks it has to go about it. So when are you hoping to have clarity on which institutions have signed on 
before you close this? At the end of the... No, the, the, there's an announcement of, uh, I think, is it 10 days or so for interested bondholders to sign on. Oh, okay. So, no, I didn't hear that, that oh. announcement. Oh. So that's the clarity. Yeah. So, beginning when? Uh, from today. From today. Yes. So, all institutional investors who want to sign on have 10 days to do so. I, well, I'm not very sure of the number of days, but okay. there's a period which I think was 10 days, but I'm not so sure. Of that. Okay, because we need to clarify, because yes. that, remember that this is all part of trying it, to get it, people to it, come. It, exactly. And information it, is, is keen in this, it, in, in this matter. Yes, but it's an opening and a closure, and by that time we'll be able to know how many people have signed on. Certainly before the end of, of the, the year, of, course, yes. of, of December. Yes, I believe it's 10 days. Yeah. Okay, for them to sign on. Yes. So if at the end of this period, yes. some haven't signed on, yes. what happens? It means they are not entitled to the buffer arrangements we have provided. It means they are prepared to go with the market and face all the consequences that they may be there. And that is it. So that means you wouldn't be able to pay them etc could be and if it's a pension fund it may directly it may even be worse with that approach than we we're working together to redeem it yeah but but then the, the workers who the individuals who will be affected as a result will, will come after you well so that's the stark reality of course uh, that you may not be able to get your funds if of course uh, those managing your bonds uh, do not decide to sign up to the debt exchange program. Uh, based on this, the Attorney General, in a legal opinion, is asking the Finance Minister uh, to refrain from taking any decision that will make him use legislative instruments to retrospectively limit holders of domestic bonds. So let's bring you excerpts of what it is that the Attorney General has been uh, speaking about, excerpts of that uh, on your screens right now. Uh, in view of the foregoing, it is my opinion, as the Attorney General is indicating, that first of all, in the absence of uh, an agreement by the parties, it will be unlawful for the government to unilaterally introduce a class action uh, agreements as it is, that's the CACs, into uh, the bond agreements and may constitute an event of default under clause 12 of the terms and conditions of the bonds issued, of course, uh, under the debt exchange program. Uh, beyond this as well, the Attorney General is equally uh, cautioning the Finance Minister against taking some steps. First of all, the indirect approach of the enactment of an Act of Parliament or legislative instrument uh, prescribing a collective action mechanism in relation to the bonds is plausible insofar as the proposed inclusion of the voting percentage threshold for effecting change to the bond agreement does not interfere with the accrued rights of any party or third party beneficiaries of bond agreements and also does not operate retrospectively to impose limitations that adversely affect the personal rights and liberties of any party to a bond agreement beyond their will. So it's clear now what it is that the Attorney General has been advising the Finance Minister on. In fact, he's going ahead to even caution against the use of executive powers. So, for instance, executive powers, including the executive instruments such as emergency powers, may not be, quote, lawfully employed to impose uh, class uh, actions agreements on bondholders since they will operate retrospectively and may also constitute an, an event of default under clause 12 of the terms and conditions of the bonds issued under the program and may be in breach of the terms of the bond agreement. So that's the warning coming through from the Attorney General. And of course, uh, there will be a need, as he's indicating, that there will be a need for voluntary engagement with relevant parties uh, to the bond agreement that will be able to produce some outcome of uh, voluntary modification, which government is giving a clear stance on that they will stick to. Uh, so uh, looking at all of this, what will be the legal implication and what will the signal to our markets? I want to introduce now uh, Mona Corte. She's a former uh, deputy minister in charge of finance. Uh, Joseph Dindiokpenka is also a former deputy attorney general. Thank you, gentlemen and lady, for joining us here on The Pulse. Let me start off with you, Mona Kote. Uh, of course, government says it intends to run a voluntary debt exchange program. Do you see this working feasibly? 
Blessing, thank you very much. Good afternoon to yourself and your audience. Um, to answer your question directly, it is possible, it's a structure that can be executed, but it requires um, all the compliance boxes being checked, as you've rightly read out, legal compliance, um, social compliance, financial compliance, that all these boxes are ticked. So in terms of a structure, it is a viable structure. In terms of will it work for Ghana in the circumstances, I have my doubts. One, as you've rightly said, the Attorney General has raised some red flags. Two, there has not been any real consultation with debt instrument holders. And we all know that many of us Ghanaians hold some of these instruments. There's been no conversation with any of us as to how it will be done. When the uh, president in his speech to Ghanaians, his fellow Ghanaian speech said, there will be no haircuts. And then there were so many adjustments made to that statement. We are now realizing that they are talking about no haircuts, meaning no, um, no haircuts on principle, but there'll be no interest except what they are dictating. I mean, for a, a contract to be changed midstream so radically is totally unacceptable. What this does for us as a nation, even if we as individuals wanted to accept it, what this does as a, for a nation is that it sends signals that we are not law abiding, we don't keep to contract terms, we can change them midstream, and therefore we become an even more uh, risky country or nation to deal with. Country risk, political risk starts to go high, the pricing of that is going to be factored into our borrowing, if we can even borrow at all from the international market. But also we send signals even to our own people that when we sell them risk-free in quotes, treasury bills and bonds, this is what can happen to it. This has medium to long-term implications, which are not good for this nation. And at this point, I really have to say, and I usually do not like to make such categorical statements, but this economic manage management team has failed our nation miserably by being so opaque, not being transparent, not discussing and informing people exactly what is going on with the IMF program, what is entailed. We knew that they did not pass the debt sustainability assessment um, requirement. And we kept talking about debt restructuring and that it would happen. They kept saying no. And now here it is in a form of fashion that is so, it's asking more questions than giving answers. So at this time, although the structure may be viable, it's in a context of a no-win situation. Many people are asking more questions. And I'm not sure that the government itself is guaranteeing us that this pain will result in a turnaround for the nation long after they have gone and left Ghanaians in the dust. Because 2028 and all those years that they refer to are years by which time there'll be other ruling parties or governments in place and they will be gone and other people have to bear the consequences. And I just Bottom want to... line, the nation will have to bear the consequences of their mismanagement and they coming up with solutions that they have not discussed thoroughly and even thought through properly. Uh, and just borrowing the words of uh, the former, uh, the deputy finance minister, he says, we're in this together, we either swim or perish. That's how dire the situation is. So when government asks for alternatives that are beside the debt exchange program, feasibly, what could we be exploring? Government never discussed the debt exchange program with the general public or with even other parties, trying to even create a coalition to discuss solutions with other parties. That did not happen. Many of the advice that was given much earlier was not even listened to. They didn't even want us to know exactly what was going on with the IMF discussions, not to talk about the debt restructuring. In uh, President Mahama's speech that he gave about the economy, which started with um, a presentation by Dr. Atu Fawson, 
we spoke at length about debt restructuring and potential haircuts and preparing the nation for such a time. But they kept saying no. They knew what they were doing. That's not what was going to happen. And they twisted and turned the whole story. Today, they've come up with a debt exchange, which, as I've said, in itself is not an evil thing. But it has come to people who you had said you would not do this. This is the second time the government is making a U-turn. They said they would not go to the IMF. They said there would be no haircuts. And today, here we are seeing interest being cut off. I mean, for crying out loud, if you have interest cut off from your investment or interest paid to you at a different time than you expect, looking at the time value of money, you have had a haircut. So all this gymnastics just to show that they are in effect, not there will be no haircuts and so forth, is annoying to, to say the least. Government needs to come out, say the truth, and then we can give alternatives. You cannot give alternatives to a story that is inaccurate. And therefore, there's no way that we can give alternatives except to speak to the problems on the ground and come up with some solutions which clearly have not been um, adhered to or listened to or even considered. So at this point, they've already come out with this um, nebulous solution, which people are shocked. The signals that are going out is that this nation is bankrupt because there's going to be cross defaults as we listen to what they are saying. And you are, they are even giving a timeline by which, when, uh, by which when citizens or holders of these bills and bonds don't apply for the new um, bonds and bonds, they, they will not get anything. What does that mean? That you lose your investment completely? How do you lend to a government? to Esla, to Dace, and to all that, and then lose your investment completely. This is being handled so badly and so quickly, they're not even giving um, invest, investment um, or, or in, in, investors, as it were, a chance to even think through this properly and be able to make a clear decision. Our so last blessing, uh, that is my point on it. Uh, it's very confusing, it's spinning, and the government is giving everyone a headache. And very finally, our hope is on the IMF bailout program. Uh, government was targeting the end of this year, but it appears that may not happen. What are the likely implications uh, from your Blessing. perspective? I mean, first of all, don't, don't even talk about end of year getting a program. What we had all said was at best, there'll be a staff level agreement by the end of the year. It is the government that kept telling the story about having a program. That is not even possible or feasible a staff level agreement by the end of the year as to what to do. Yet a budget comes out that does not show real seriousness towards cutting expenditure, but more on raising more revenue on a re already suffering group. We expect that sometime next year, it, when the IMF is satisfied that indeed we can cut our expenditure, we can be compliant with our revenue, and we can raise enough funds to be debt sustainable, that they will give us a board approved program. But end of this year is out. And increasingly, this government is losing credibility, especially the economic management team is losing credibility because they, give, they keep promising with timelines that don't happen. So we are not going to get a program this year. At best, it will be sometime next year. If we get our act right by cutting on expenditure, the government size, and making sure that we use the gift miss system so that we can account for our expenditure. You're predicting good times ahead? In the short term, there's going to be a lot of pain. In the medium term, there may be some ray of hope. But for now, it's going to be a lot of pain. Mona Kote, we're grateful for your time here on The Pulse and uh, thanks for joining us with your perspective. Uh, let's speak to Joseph Pemka, a former Deputy Attorney General. And of course, uh, Joe, it's a great time to be talking to you again, uh, knowing that, of course, someone you've worked closely with, uh, who's now the Attorney General, has issued his opinion on this. Uh, what's your take on uh, some of the issues being raised by the uh, Attorney General on the likely legal implications if we go ahead with a debt exchange program. Uh, possibly uh, we may have to go back to some of the key issues uh, the uh, audit the Attorney General is raising and uh, you'd have excerpts of, of that 
on your screens uh, shortly. Uh, but I just want to pick up your thoughts, initial reaction to this likely impact that we may be in breach as a nation of the, I mean, bond contracts if we go ahead with the debt exchange program. Yeah, good afternoon, my brother. Good afternoon to your cherished listeners and viewers. Good afternoon to my brother and uh, learned colleague, uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister, and good afternoon to my colleague on the other line, the Honorable Monakote. First of all, let me say preliminarily that when I heard the finance minister lay out those well-thought-out ways of getting out of the present situation, I raised a question immediately. In fact, I didn't even know there was an opinion coming from AG, but I immediately raised the question. The question I raised was the bonds were advertised, people went in to buy, so it became a contract, okay? Then you had the offer and then the acceptance, basic principles of the law of contract. There was an offer, there was an acceptance, and then the contract was consummated. So you had people coming in to take these bonds in return, they paid certain monies, and et cetera. And so the contract was concluded at that level. And there were deadlines and deadlines as to when these executions would be carried out by the party. So it was not within the capacity of any of the contracting parties to unilaterally come out with a, a, a roadmap and indeed without consultation with the other party. It was not. So that is the first beef that I had. And I actually raised it when I, when I read what the Honorable Finance Minister did. It has good intentions. It is an excellent idea to get out of our current economic doldrum and quagmire that we find ourselves in. It's a very fantastic idea of trying to think through the box to get out of a situation. But you have to get the fundamentals right. Otherwise, you would, you would get it basically wrong. And then the other contracting parties can raise issues. And then a court of law may have to make a determination. And that will take us backwards and etc. And so I believe that... Yes, you're, 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 not, you're not touching on the key concerns of the um, Attorney General. I, I just want us to perhaps that's go back, exactly, go back what, to some of the, some exactly of the key points he's raising. Right. Because I'm not going to look at the long ride up. I'm looking at the conclusion. Yeah, the what then is the conclusion? Uh, well, well, we'll get that on the screens right now. Let, let's go back to what, what it is that the uh, Attorney General has been talking about. In terms of the conclusion, uh, and, and we'll get that for you shortly. The Attorney General appears not to be enthused about using legal instruments just to try and get through this, uh, of course, debt exchange program. That's his conclusion. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I have actually said, if you have heard me. What I'm saying is that, you see, if you look at the way he set out his arguments, even inside decided cases by our superior courts of judicature to buttress his position, if you, if you have looked at the, uh, the, the, the opinion. He says that it's been made, uh, this is several decisions have been taken, that once contracting parties agree on a matter and they enter into a contract for the execution of a particular project or a financial instrument and etc., then it does not lie in the amount of one of them to unilaterally abrogate or dictate terms without recourse to the original agreement that they actually entered into that gave birth to the original contract. And so if you look at the opinion, as I said, I totally agree with the Attorney General, and I thought that what the Finance Minister had said was going to be a proposal or a roadmap that then will have to be accepted by the other contracting parties before it is consummated. Otherwise, if it becomes a final document which is compelling or mandatorily supposed to be imposed on the other contracting parties, that would be suppression, it will be unlawful, and then they have to, the other parties may, may be compelled to seek redress in a court of law. And then the very progress we intend to achieve by it, the release that the finance minister made will be derailed completely. So I'm saying that the engagement that the state was supposed to have, the finance ministry was supposed to actually have with the other contracting parties, which hasn't been done, it is not too late in the day to do. The consultation processes can go on, let us reach agreements concrete enough by both contracting parties so that in the end, when we are carrying out this, we will affect every other legal ways that people will seek in court to derail and affect the opportunity that government is seeking to exploit to be able to get out of the situation. So my take on it is straightforward, that 
Once it is a contract that you go into for these bonds to be issued, for the contracting parties to actually enjoy their rights with respect to the bonds that have been issued, one of the parties cannot unilaterally take the terms long after it has been consummated or executed. And that is basically what the Attorney General is saying. You, you agree this put government, uh, this is actually putting government uh, austerity plan in a difficult position. Uh, the, the fact that if anyone or any of the um, domestic bond holders decides to disregard this debt exchange program on a voluntary basis, government is bound by law to make sure that the, the, fi the funding is made available. But you have the deputy minister saying, well, you'll be on your own if you don't sign up for the program. Well, that, that is why I'm telling you that if you go that way and then the consultation is not deep and there's no consensus building, and appeal to the person to subscribe to the idea you are mooting, and you decide to go unilateral and go the line that you are going to suppress the other side by virtue of state power and authority, then you are going to face a certain level of difficulty. Because some of these persons, as I did indicate, can go to a court of law and ask for a declaration in their favor that what you are doing constitutes a breach of contract, and to, the, to that extent, the courts would compel government to act in a certain way or manner. And I'm saying that that again will derail the process because you cannot stop anybody from going to court anyway. And that will derail the process. So rather than a certain posturing of we will go ahead and do A, B, C, D, damn you, we should rather be appealing to the conscience of these and build some kind of consensus around it so that the implementation process can be very smooth and transparent to the admiration of both parties. Remember that the country is not ending today or tomorrow. It is going to exist in perpetuity. And whatever we do today with these bonds and instruments will have an influence in uh, going forward in our dealings with the public and other uh, entities tomorrow. Uh, right. So very very I, finally, I what, what, what will prevent, what, what will prevent, of course, in terms of law or precedence, what, what will prevent uh, the Republic of Ghana from passing any law that would go retrospect? Is it the case that it has not... No, it's, that would be unconstitutional. Right. That would be clearly unconstitutional because retrospectivity in our constitution is completely outlawed. And any attempt to make a law that would take retrospective effect will be shut down by any competent court where it is brought for interpretation by the Supreme Court or uh, for a pronouncement by any superior court of education. So it's very clear that we, a parliament can enact a law. But in enacting that law, it has to be cautious that it doesn't breach the principles and basic of the Constitution to the extent that uh, the law takes with its effect, because that clearly, by virtue of our history, has been outlawed black and white in our Constitution. There is no debate about it. So I, I think that rather than talking about legality and other issues that we we'll use to further derail the process and suppress the rights of persons or individuals, entities, and etc., I think engagement will be the way to go, and then you get everybody on board and restructure it in a manner that will be consensus building. I think that would be the best way forward. Mm. Because if we want to be go by strict legally, then somebody will come and say that, yes, I entered into this with you under the agreement that ABCD will happen. Once you have not been able to do this, I'm walking out of it and I'm taking my money back. That, again, would be problematic for us. And I think that the posturing has to change and then consensus building will have to take the lead rather than going too legalistic. Otherwise, as I said, people will be compelled under the circumstances to seek pronouncements from courts, which would derail the very process we are, we are seeking to project. Well, uh, we just hope that government will indeed find the middle ground. Joseph Dean Yokpenka is a former Deputy Attorney General. Thank you for your time here on The Pulse. Uh, even as we speak about uh, Ghana's economic crisis uh, in Parliament, a lot has been happening. Government's budget statement and economic policy for the 2023 fiscal year has been approved by Parliament. Processes leading to the adoption of the economic plan was faced with stiff opposition from the uh, minority and even some NPP lawmakers who uh, already or earlier threatened to boycott the budget approval process owing to President Tekufuado's failure to dismiss Finance Minister Ken Oferiata. In spite of the controversies, uh, the budget statement, as we understand, has been passed by majority vote in Parliament. Uh, joining us now is uh, Parliamentary Correspondent Kweku Asante, who has uh, the very latest for us. Uh, Kweku, take us away. Now it's been approved, but of course it was not without an incident. I'm sure that there were some concerns by the minority side in the House. Correct. So yes, um, blessed. Before the budget was approved, before the Speaker of Parliament put that question, 
the minority and majority leaders concluded the debate on the budget and economic policy of government. We first said from the minority leader, Harun Ibris, who made the point that the current economic um, challenges is self-inflicted. is because of government's unbridled borrowing. And he accused directly the Minister for Finance, who was in the House, of spearheading this. He said that despite government accepting that there's a crisis, they are failing to accept responsibility. They are failing to say that we are the cause of the mess and to seek apology from Ghanaians. And so he went on and said that the minority were going to reject or resist the approval of the 2.5% the, the, the increase in VAT. We later heard from the majority leader who said that this VAT rate increase will primarily used to finance road construction. And so if the minority thought that they did not want new roads, then they should say. And so he rallied uh, their support for the, the, this approval. So the Speaker of Parliament then put the question for the approval of the budget statement and economic policy. Mind you, this is not everything. This is just a statement that was um, made by the finance minister on the floor of the House two weeks ago that has now been approved. When the Speaker of Parliament put the question, it appeared at the first instance that the no's had it. The minority shouted no. The Speaker of Parliament asked that the vote be put again. And this time around, according to him, the eyes had it. And so he proceeded to declare that the 23, 2023 budget statement and economic policy of government has now been approved. But as, like I told you, the minority insisted that their laws had it, but there was no challenge, mm. and this has been done. Okay. What is going to happen next right. is that... The yeah, but the question still remains as to how we're able to get this sufficient number to pass the budget. The debate process, processes leading to this were not encouraging. Of course, that featured prominently uh, on the floor of the House. Indeed, during the debate um, um, from last week, the House was virtually empty, and we brought uh, viewers a report about that. And so this time around, the concerns were that if the numbers were that low, then the minority were going to be able to disapprove of the budget like they did last year. But this time around, it appears the whips on both sides really went to work. At the time, the minority leader and the majority leader concluded the debate. The House was virtually full. Almost every seat was occupied. And so it was clear that both leaders were working to get their numbers on the floor for this approval process to take place. And so the vote was eventually put by voice, and then the budget was approved. Mm. Anyway, quick question, you would have to leave it here for now. I'm sure a lot more is happening on the floor that you have to catch up with. We're grateful. Uh, but don't forget that, of course, uh, the process is leading to the uh, approval of this budget. Part of the key concerns by some NPP MPs was that the president would have to either reshuffle or fire the finance minister, Ken Oferreta. So why is the president still having a difficulty in reassigning the finance minister? Well,